Hello and welcome to The Invited. We've got a show for you today. We are going out there. We're off. We're on it. We, we're on that rocket ship called Weirdness tonight. But it's a weirdness with a nice W. I'll be honest with you because we have got the one and only Joanna Summerscales on the show. How you doing, Joanne? You're well. Hello, I'm I'm great. Uh, I was just saying I'd I'd love to have to have had this a couple of days after this date so I could have done my hair. Look at that. Oh, I'll behave. <laughs> Looking good. You're looking good. And, and I was actually going to say our intro video was an old picture of you because you've had your hair done, obviously. But, you know, <laughs> we can never get it right, can we? So I'm no. glad you're OK. We've just been having a bit of a pre-show chat about bits and pieces. And Joanne's been keeping me updated with all kinds of things that is going on in the world of Joanna Summerscales, which is vast, wide and exciting. <laughs> Believe you me, we're going to we're going to cover some aspects this evening that you're probably going to sit there and you're going to go, where are they going? Well, hang tight, grip hold of something sturdy, careful now, and be prepared because we're going to take you on a rocket ride. Here we go. Um, I've just got to start, if I may, Joanne, is that by saying that I've been um, uh, I've been a follower of your work for many a year now we've um with with my old friend jamie we used to we actually came down where was it nottingham we came down to see yep. you do uh, my, my first ever yeah. amash conference yes 2012 amash, that's right now a mash that was a that was an experience wasn't it um when you started that's is that where you first came into the arena there with um you followed well, it, aliens it, it, it and was such? publicly it was yeah. publicly I, I mean it, it's interesting isn't it how life goes i mean people mm. You know, say to me, well, how did how did that all? How did you come to where you are now? And uh, you know, like must have been like an aha moment. I didn't have any epiphany. It wasn't anything <laughs> like that. It was a slow learner here. Well, it worked. <laughs> it worked. Just, I mean, yeah, you were introducing was... all kinds of people into the arena, weren't you? About yeah. so, a lot of them were having some very odd and questionable. I'm going to be honest with you, questionable experiences. But uh, nevertheless. It was an exciting time and um, you rocketed in, as you do, with full gusto, with absolute conviction with what you're doing and took it apart. You literally took the British UFO, UFO scene apart right there and right then. And that's what grabbed me. I mean, my friend Jamie, he knew a little bit more about you at the time than I did, I must be honest. And he was, you know, jenning me up on the car trip down up to Nottingham from London. It's this, it's that, it's the other, blah, blah, blah. Watch out for this. Oh, this guest is going to be on. You love this one. You you know, watch out for that one. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell am I going to expect? Well, we turned up and it was amazing. I walked away absolutely sold i thought oh my god this is it that, that this where the hell I'm, i was expecting to see something on the nine o'clock ten o'clock news that evening because oh, really? some of the stuff that would come out i'm thinking how the hell has the media not picked up on this for god we, we did have quite a lot of media uh, actually we we did i think the sun picked something up or was that oh, after the book i can't remember did, now. actually we did, did have, we did have a flurry yeah. And also around 2014, I did. Um, we actually had um, the Wall Street Times guy come over. I mean, really? Yeah. I said, "Are you having a break or something?" He was actually a financial reporter. I said, "Oh, what are you doing here then?" And yeah. uh, you know, looked at me a bit funny, and and uh, you know, was obviously there with a the story. But you know what? He he didn't he didn't cane it. He didn't. No. no. You know, because no. get under my beady eye. <laughs> Oh, and that's that's what it is with you, isn't it? I mean, you are one hundred percent focused on everything that you do. I don't think I've ever seen you go in and do anything half cocked or no, leave I, it half. -cocked. I can't. No. no, got to be professional. And you can say, well, what does that mean? It just means getting a job done and doing it to the best of your ability, and and to the best of of the ability for those around you who are going to experience whatever it is that, that you're doing. You know, for me, a conference or a, a book or a program or, or something you know I, I don't I'm I don't have a, a huge amount of technical skills and I, I'm kind of learning on the hoof I still am and um, you know it shows for to me because a part of my initial background was um, I did quite a bit of freelancing in TV with people like Channel 4 and a lot of independence and stuff just doing computer generated stuff like text and digital Absolutely. library stores of DSL and uh, or LS and uh, all the rest of that and 
kicking the channel for computer when it wouldn't <laughs> when it wouldn't work just as you're going to go live and be running out <laughs> to the main yeah, frame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and so you know kind of I'm used to the timing and I've you know used to doing you know to to put a show together really well mm. it, it it isn't it isn't always just pointing a camera and getting someone to chat to, you know there, there's timelines there, there's inclusions of this and that and the, you know and it can be quite a a, a complex uh, program pro process but an enjoyable one and Absolutely. if you get it right a bit of magic happens and and the whole yeah. thing about doing what I was doing was to, I guess, bring a, a sense of kudos and in terms of professionalism, as to the best of my ability, again, as I could to the subject and also to give those people, especially experiences uh, mm -hmm. uh, and some really good researchers, a platform in which they could feel they were safe to express themselves. They weren't yeah. going to get a kick in the pants from yeah. me. They were going to get, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean I necessarily have to or, or even understand everything they they tell me or told me or, or that I would agree but but you know freedom of speech is very important and uh, these people you know have something in my book something very important to share as by these people I mean the experiences and the researchers who are very close to them and that subject because uh, wow that's where we're going to be that's where we're going next to the stars <laughs> well exactly and to be honest with you right let, let, let's wrap it back now to the Amash, the very kind of nucleus of uh, Joanna Summerscales, really, where you came into the forefront. And as you say, the media turned their heads and they thought, hello, something's going on here. Well, they did a little bit. Not, not yeah, they did. They did, though, didn't they? I mean, you think, I think you're being very modest there, Joanna, if I'm well, being Well, really you know, honest. I was working jobs and I, I was very, I was just earning a living and then doing all of this in, in between times. And just doing what is it you know so so when you're running like that you don't really I, I wasn't paying attention to what was really going on I was just dealing mm -hmm. with it on a moment by moment basis so mm -hmm. maybe to you it looks a bit different well, but to me does. I think the perception was definitely out there that hold on a minute this is different this is new this is good I like it can you explain basically what a mash was all about yeah so the word it's, it's a bit of a funny word i know but it's it's i was really trying to embrace everything from the mind control to the contactee so amash stands for adductee um, uh, um and sorry i'll start again anomalous mind management abductee contactee helpline because i i still have a number that i that is the same number uh, that i give out and so amash just became an umbrella for a, a platform really that was essentially giving experiences um, and those people associated with the subject, you know, it could go into the spiritual, the paranormal, but mainly essentially initially, it was about the experiencer because sometimes that uh, experiencer experience is quite of a challenge. And, you know, there is PTSD, the, the post-traumatic stress syndrome. There's lots of areas of discomfort and stress, uh, trauma even, and I don't mean it is a given. Some people have are okay with it, and some people don't have stress or trauma, but some people do. People's marriages, people's businesses, and friendships have gone to the wall, and that's common. I mean, people have lost entire family structures because they have stood out um, and said, this happened to me because it is so, you know, a huge thing for anything like this to happen to anyone. I mean, you just imagine it, something huge and anomalous, just meaning the unknown. We don't know how to quantify that. And it is a very broad reaching, broad spectrum word. That's mm -hmm. why I used it to, to encompass just about anything that challenges or, or the mental, emotional, psychical and physical um, capacities of, of humanity. And, uh, you know, people would find themselves in all kinds of strange scenarios. Um, uh, and it's about, it was about, you know, it's, for, ah, for me, this is about education. And I've always been very interested in education. And when I was, um, because I took a, I took a, um, uh, a certificate for, for, educa for education to teach adult um, um in, in any adult educational establishment in the country, should I so wish. And I really did that to see if what I was doing and the way I was doing it in teaching workshops 
are providing platforms for people to come and share their work and then for me to guide and lead that and yeah. to come in with various information whether whether I was kind of on the right track from from a from from their guidelines point of view as a teacher so I just wanted to see if I if I what well, in fact I, I I was doing do, doing okay and it was just I needed more handouts <laughs> so but anyway so I, you know I did I already had quite a lot going on that fed into what I was doing on the platform and also because of disability in my family that's quite it kind of was a big thing in my life and other issues going on um, mm -hmm. I went I went head first into um, non-allopathic healthcare that is you know not your established medical route but I was very interested in looking at those psychosomatic those differently orientated issues that came in and had physical effect for example I had um, say from childhood um, a, a fear uh, and this is I'll just use this to illustrate where I have come from and where it's fitting in sure. um, a fear really strong fear of going down stone steps stairs or cement steps not so much with wooden and you think well how how, how weird is that well it was weird but as a child I'm talking a small child from mm. when I was really conscious I could say you know seven eight going to school and coming down the the concrete steps and stuff like that and I would hold on for dear life and I can tell you now, I am still very careful, like anybody might be, but I still have an extra eye for the stairs because, very interesting, um, so a lot of things took me on the route of becoming a, a regression therapist. I was also a member of the National Federation of Spiritual Healers at one time. I am no longer, but I did that for a few years. Uh, I mean, not that those skills ever leave you. It's just that I choose not to be part of, uh, you, you know, kind of a system in that way anymore. But when I went and, and did my own training and went through my own stuff as a regression therapist trainee, what I found for that memory, for example, was uncovering. And this is what, what happens with, uh, I don't work with a lot of um, abductees or whatever in this way, but a lot of people have. We've read a lot about those. And I think it's been done now. And, you know, we yeah. don't need to perhaps do it that way anymore. Yeah. But for, for myself, just to illustrate this last um, thing I was telling you about was I had um, a very strong image and feeling everything was was cellular memory that you could feel everything and see it and sense it and smell it that whole thing and I was up the top of a battlement area and I don't know what era this would be there was a there was a myself my sister who is the sister who is disabled in this life she was about three she was in a little dress that looked like I would say it belonged to the class of a noble person or a noble family of some kind I was a little boy I was about five years old same kind of difference in age between us interestingly enough and I was dressed again in fine clothes um, and then there was this guy who was in chain mail and uh it was his job to dispatch us and oh, okay. And, and and clearly we had been taken up to the turret part to be uh, jettisoned from the top. And so this guy picked up my sister, didn't care anything, threw her over. And, and whilst he was throwing her over, I ran down these tiny, you know, stairs, that, you know, they're so tiny and narrow, aren't they? And very steep. And, um, and, and, I, and I fell, I fell to my death, I broke my neck. And that's how I died in that life whenever that was. I haven't done any research on, on when and where that might have been. I think it might have been France, possibly mm -hmm. here. I, I don't know anyway. It doesn't really matter. And, you know, the story doesn't actually really matter. But it was very interesting because from then on, I never had that same kind of fear. It, like, cleared it. The oh, understanding, the sensation, the witnessing of my sister and also because that, that was traumatic for me, of course, in that moment before my own death as a five year old, um, I would have had that memory. And that's probably why we came back together. This life is so we can continue our friendship relationship, which, uh, you know, we have a very strong friendship. Um, and she has multiple sclerosis and has been wheelchair bound for a long, long, long time. Mm. Um, so isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And uh, and also accompanied with the stairs, uh, there was another thing. I used to have an unbelievable irrational fear of walking past high-sided buildings or pantechnicans parked on the road. I mean, as a little girl, I remember it was like it was like a terror. It was like, and it was to do with the height of the building oh, okay. as we were taken up and up and up, knowing what the outcome was going to be, and it wasn't good. Right. So, so anyway. 
that was just part of you know the reason why I went into what I was doing but all of this feeds back into you know the understanding the capacity to have compassion um even if you don't always understand it we don't understand exactly. all of this I mean my goodness no. I mean I don't care whether you're Einstein or or not or an, even an experiencer and I don't mean that in any other way than there are so many layers and one oh, of their one experience Absolutely. for them is not at all like an ex and 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 again we have so many different life forms and beings you know coming along so uh, a lot of my background including theater which was to do with speaking having having the ability to speak forward speak out be heard and do that reasonably well and that's not that it's not an ego statement it's about being understood if, if mm -hmm. you get what i mean mm -hmm. so that was it's interesting how all of this has sort of factored into what i'm doing to this point and again doing i used to work for freelance tv companies as i said or as a freelancer for tv companies um and all of that learning learning the craft of you know how to put things together and even if I can't do it technically that well at the moment, I know I know what should be done. You know what I mean? Well, this is what strikes me. I mean, it's it's the whole um, planning that you put together, and there's a million and one ideas. There's lots of things going mm. on. Extremely creative person. That that just beams through here. Now, um, with all of that said, I mean, uh, from from what I witnessed on that uh, journey up to Nottingham. I wasn't, ex I'll be honest with you, I wasn't expecting a great deal because I've been on a couple of these things with my friend Jamie before and it's very much, you know, you're meeting in the back of a room, there's someone there mumbling, you can't hear what they're saying, nothing's really constructed. It was a production. Together. Yeah, with yourselves, that's what I'm saying. You came in and you, it wasn't like you were being entertained for showmanship, but you were being entertained because... All the structures are in place. You could hear what people were saying. You could see them properly. And even though, I must be honest, one or two people I didn't quite think were on the level, at least you got a good idea as to where yeah. they were coming from. You know. Yeah. So yeah. with the experiences that you had on on these, uh, because Nottingham wasn't your only one, of course, you, you, you were all over the show, weren't you? You were, you were going everywhere with this. Well, I I, uh, I did four four Amash conferences in the end. I mean, I I had done conferences before. I did five years of doing a complementary healthcare, um, right? Uh, um, you know, conferences down in the Hastings area some some years prior. So right. it was just it's just a way to to uh, engage people and a way to, uh, to allow people to come in publicly so they don't feel self-conscious. So, you, you know, if you're in a, a group, you don't yeah, feel yeah. that you're being singled out or you feel self-conscious going to ask somebody about X or Y. Same with healthcare, you know, complementary healthcare. Um, uh, well, uh, it came well. across for sure that the guys and the la ladies and gents, and there were a few that, actually, that I watched getting up on the podium kind of thing to express, you know, to explain yeah. their experiences. Not one of them felt intimidated by oh, nervous of course nerves that's only natural but no one mm -hmm. felt intimidated at all by anyone else well even interestingly you that say that, speaking sorry even, even though you though you say that i got wind and i i'm not going to say who who this was about <sighs> but i got wind that somebody had mentioned to one of my speakers that they must not mention the reptilians i said <laughs> excuse me right. Right. You must not mention some of your deep experience because it happens to be a reptilian. And I and anyway, I know who said it. <clears throat> and um, and she was very, very nervous and she was going to pull. She was going, not going to present because oh, she was incredibly know. nervous and she didn't know how it took. It was like pulling hen's teeth to get some of the people to speak that did not because they were difficult, but because they were so nervous, they were so fearful of what it would do to them and yeah. you know people have to understand you know this is a big deal yeah yeah you know even doing this kind of work speaking like this it's it's mm. a big deal for some people yeah, and yeah. so um you might have noticed that i went and stood by them yes and i said oh yes you will it was, that's, that's what i mean it was the it was mm. the full support on, on up there. <laughs> you were right there with them absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. because yeah. I, I won't have bullying i will not have it <laughs> it's not absolutely on. brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> the course, globe is being done. bullied at the moment and i won't have that either no, <laughs> not for no, myself absolutely not well i watched that 
uh, presentation, that, that whole thing. Thoroughly enjoyed the day, I must be honest. I came away from there and I'm saying to Jamie, my God, when's the next one? It was like that. So, I know the food was great in the Britannia oh, the Hotel, I tell you. I, didn't, I didn't get any of I it. Just about, but anyway, I remember yeah. it being beautiful. Always judge a good gig by the food plates, I tell you. It's always yeah, good that's one. been the best one ever. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really good. So moving on for now, I mean, because you went... Um, yeah, with, with the conferences, you did a few, as you said, you, you did quite a few there, but also video wise. Now, uh, OK, we're not going to mention too many names here, but the, you did get into the video production side of it all. And uh, yeah, I mean, you went I down am. that journey in that channel I'm and that did very well for you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, de definitely. I mean, you know, to, there's nobody who's going to do this work for you. You have to do it yourself. Mm. Um, if, you, if you want to do what I'm doing, you, you know, I mean, there's lots of other people doing it now. Uh, there weren't quite so many back in 2011, which is when uh, the Amash project started. Uh, but not that I was really so much aware of that, really. I'd got my head down. I was working, uh, you know, looking after one or two other people. And uh, and I was just doing what I could to, to get the Amash project going. And I did a lot. I, I did do a lot, a lot of work there. <clears throat> but um, anyway... Anyway, so uh, it, it was a good it was a good platform. And what was interesting to me was that um, I, I started getting I thought it would just be a UK thing. I, I was in fact, initially, I was going to name it something quite different because I was based in the East Midlands at the time. And I was just going to do it as a regional thing. Oh, and I'm so glad I, did. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't make it a, a national or regional. You know, I just gave it a, a name. But I, I had actually I'd started it six months before but I haven't actually moved on it and I found the old bit of paperwork and stuff that I'd been preparing those six months before because I it started I started in January 2011 and in 2010 in the summer then I was looking at the different names for the region and someone said to me I, I don't think you should limit it to the region and I went, nah, OK, because I didn't know where I was going to end up being, to be honest, anyway. So that was a good thing. And and then it just went international. There's just mm -hmm. I had loads of very, very off the um, off the charts kind of calls about that. Well, not off the chart experiences, not calls. Well, off the chart experiences. Exactly. It's took you worldwide, doesn't it? It's took you global. You've been well, where haven't you been? Let's put it that way. <laughs> You've done, you've, done, you've done it all over the place. I mean, um, I've seen you do stuff. I mean, on your – what's your YouTube channel? It's it's now changed, isn't it? It's ETN News Channel, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, the Amash Project, um, because the – I had to change the name, and I had to change it because the my website, which was the Amash uh, amash.co.uk, was yeah. hacked, and yeah. it, it was non – it was not savable. Uh, and it meant I had to close it pretty instantly because mm. of the nature of the hacking. Yeah. I don't need to go into that. But, yeah, quite um, vicious, wasn't it? Yeah. It was very vicious. I mean, somebody was certainly trying to take me down, take mm -hmm. down my work. And they they did a good job because it, it kind of knocked me through a hoop for, for a little while. And it meant I had to regroup. And uh, someone just said to me, you know, that someone was helping me with a website kind of scenario. And they mm -hmm. just said, Joan, think of a name quick now, 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 now. And I just, I, I don't know, it's not the best name, the ET Newsroom you know, because I'm not here every day putting news out, but there's lots of news in what I'm doing. <laughs> That's great. It works. It does the job. ETN, ET Newsroom, there you ETN. go. ETN, it, it was actually meant to be the way um, I've had some of the lettering, you know, the, the artwork done, which is done by Dan Vallely, Vallely rather, of uh, the Eclectia uh, document, documentary mm -hmm. and album. Um, he's a graphic artist as well, and he made it look a bit like the ITN of the UK it news. It does a bit, doesn't it? Like yeah, ETN, really does. it, it was done, done, done consciously. So, so that's, you know, that changed, and it, it forced me to regroup because, um, believe it or not, folks, I mean, not maybe today, but there have been UFO researchers and a lot of people who've gone to the wire with really amazing information in years past who've died because they have dared to do it. The same with, you know, free energy technologies of which the, you know, ufological world is all hooked into. Why well, is, do you think the government thing, I'm guys. telling you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is, this is a real thing, Joanne. This is a real thing. I know. Like, people I know. always say to me, now, oh, come off it, Johnny. No, people don't get blanking. You know, t that's all Hollywood. Behave yourself. That Well, well, uh, if, if your friend that. cares to go look, there's actually someone's very cleverly done a list 
of all the people who have died since the early, I don't know, the early time, 50s or 40s, right. 50s, 40s, probably including Forrestal and all the rest of that, the mm. um, American. Even here in the UK, it's it's very, very potent with stuff like that. I mean, even yeah. dare I say, even with the days of the Marconi situations and bits and pieces. Oh, my goodness. You know about that? Wow. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. Do you know about Hillary Porter's involvement yeah. with yeah. that? That's yeah. amazing. Over at Farnborough, yeah. Her her other half is is also on the album, but and I've done an update with her as really? well, which I've yet to edit. Um, it was done over a year ago. I just haven't had a chance to do it. Well, I come and... from Aldershot, which is just down the road from Farnborough. Oh, right. So I've known of all of that kind of thing, and especially with the the area that she was looking into with the Marconi connections as well, because was it her uncle or her grandfather? Something along those lines. Was it some um, family member that was... Um, no, is Marconi it a grandfather or is it an uncle? You've got me there. Um, he, they were head Something of the like RAEF. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, right. Which which I think it's now... The, the, the bigger, larger corporation goes under the name of Kinetic. I think that's kind of absorbed all of that stuff. Kinetic, and yeah. they've got... She and Ken... So it's Henry Porter, who's a lifelong experiencer, and Ken Parsons, who is also a musician, again, one somebody on the album. And uh, they they run Beans, the British Earth and Aerial Mysteries Society. I I and, and, and they put out a lot of very interesting stuff. They're very quiet, but they put out, they've done a lot of research on the kinetic stuff and, and how, if you look at it, um, it looks like an ET's on oh, the outline the of the plan of the of the ground, the plan of the, is, the ground plan wow. of the building, guys. This well, is um, guys. If if one one of, one of these shows, what we're going to have to do, Joanne, is bring you back on an added extra show with us. And what we'll do, we'll bring in a load of photos of this of this landmass. Oh, yeah. that they've well, got. If you just go onto the Beam website, you'll see some. Yeah. Well, yes, of course. But what yeah. we'll do is we'll 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 get in touch with Hillary and uh, see if she would like oh, to yeah. pop along and have a chat oh, she, as well. She, I'm sure. I'm sure she would. Do you want to at this stage? I, I'm just. I, I'm aware as something to share as well. You mentioned Marconi, and I don't know if anybody knows what Marconi is. Do you Go want for to? It. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's. Oh, you it. want me to say? <laughs> Go for it. So, uh, well, um, well, I I may I may know a little bit, but I think you yeah, may no. know more. Yeah, no, tell, tell us what you know. And then okay, we'll, I'll tell you, we'll I'll tell you what in. I know. So, so I, I did some interviews with, with this wonderful lady, Hilary Porter, and she in, um, now you may be able to help me, was it, I'm trying to think, it's something like the early 70s that Hilary was working at um, Marconi, mm -hmm. and this was um, in, it's Farnborough, is it, not Farnham, Farnborough? Yeah, Farnborough, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't know why I've got a block about those two names. Anyway, and she was a draftswoman. Yeah. And this one day when she went into work, so uh, there was some top secret stuff going on because Marconi at the time was the go-to manufacturer for exotic weaponry. Yeah. Probably amongst a lot of other things. So they'd got their prototype offices there and projects being developed at this place as well. So as I said, Hillary was a draftswoman. And she recounts, um, I can't remember if it's in the first interview, it might be in the second that I'm going to do. But anyway, how she went into work this one day and there was tape everywhere, you know, do not cross this line. And there were the big wigs cars there and she, and it very early. And she thought, what the heck? And the night watchmen were all, there was one or two of them, but the one that had been on that night with his dog was no longer around. And nobody was talking and nobody was talking. And so she, because she was a draftswoman, she had access to various locations in the building. And because, uh, and part of that would mean that she would go into the prototype department as well with, with all, you know, and she was also that day expecting some more drawings to come. So it was, well, it was, you know, common to see Hillary moving throughout the building. That was, that was kind of just, you know, part of her job. So anyway, so she used that knowledge to start having a little look around. And then one area she noticed that was cordoned off, which was this top secret office. Now, this you have to remember, this is back in the early 70s. So um, there's not computers as we know them today. And there was still lots of use of filing cabinets. 
I myself use filing cabinets quite regularly, <laughs> but this was, uh, you know, top secret stuff kept in filing cabinets as well. And, and she thought, well, that's very weird. And then she noticed that the entire department of the prototype folks, all gone, like they'd never been there, yeah. completely cleared out. And she thought, wow, my God, what could have happened? Anyway, as time went on, nobody spoke initially, but as time went on, this is, as I understand it, and maybe I'll go back to my tape and, and go, oh, it's slightly different, but more or less. Um, the night watchmen were very jittery, very, uh, you know, kind of unsettled. And finally, the story got out that the guy who was on duty with his dog had seen in his, you know, walking around the buildings, had seen a light coming from this particular top secret room and when he'd gone in there there was i mean this sounds hard to believe right but it's what what he's apparently reported there was a gray some kind of a gray i don't know what size with a lamp or something like that some light emanating from his head mm -hmm. and he was rifling through i mean it sounds like a joke doesn't it but he was rifling through some documentation and i don't know what was taken I don't know if they do know what was taken. I don't know if I don't think Hillary knows what what was taken. Right. But anyway, so so that's Hillary's story. And in this next interview, which I can't wait to do because I'm, she's she's now going to be revealing something that she's never revealed before because of, it was top secret. But she says, "Oh, these years now, it won't matter." So I'm yeah, really excited about know. that. Really excited about that. It's to do with um, something that happened in Pine Gap, Australia. Anyway. So then roll a few years on into the early 80s, and you can probably, um, uh, you might know more, John, about this, but for, for over a tranche of time, various, I can't remember, was it 26, 20, 24, 26 people of various, um, various stripes in terms of, of their, their abilities, so computer programmers, yeah, yeah. managers, all to do with top secret stuff, programs and and what have you died yeah i mean in the most bizarre ways and also in the most uncharacteristic ways for example killing themselves yes yes and their families would go no that would never ever happen or very weird ways where you know someone's tying a rope around a tree to his neck gets in his car then steps on the pedal yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, you know, uh, I three don't... times. There was also, did you did you say it was Portland Down? Because there was some Portland Down situations with that as well, wasn't it? No, I, 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 di I didn't mention that bit. Yeah. Portland There's a very Down. good book called Open Verd Verdict, Verdict, Verdict mm. by Tony Collins, all, all mm. about the uh, Marconi incident, yep. incidents, um, very intriguing. Um, and he was, he was from a, actually a computer magazine, I think, mm. uh, you know, a researcher and uh, uh, reporter so that was very very interesting because uh, and and Marconi I can't think uh, where it was situated exactly then but if Hillary was working there and she wasn't too far she was driving but she wasn't I wasn't that far away and now they've got this kinetic and there she yeah. and uh, the beams people are convinced that that is um, housing you know subterranean well, it's a very Going strange on. setup, isn't it? I mean, the whole area there. I remember it from back in the day. I mean, as a, uh, I mean, I I was born in Aldershot, grew up in my early years in Aldershot, Aldershot Farnborough. It's military RAF. It's a blend between the two. Yeah. Um, so to have stories told of all kinds of weirdness, shall we say, at yeah. Farnborough, and then to be transported, my stepfather was um with um mod based in aldershot we ended up having to go up to yorkshire which is a completely different story completely and then we came back down he was then transferred back down to borden of all the places uh just outside farnham there you go that's oh, where okay. the farnham thing comes in yeah um but uh, all the time there in uh in farnborough of course we were, and my grandfather was RAF and also had a lot of connections with what was at the time the RAE, Royal Air Force yes. Establishment at Farm. Yeah. Now, they had an area locked off at the back. This is where my connection comes in. I did a little bit of, uh, it was only stores work, nothing too clever, a bit of stores work with the Royal Naval Dockyard in Portsmouth. 
Now, we were a part of the, the Tri Stores kind of um, amalgamation, getting all the stores out to all of the uh, services, you know, RAF, Navy, Army. And uh, we were hearing all kinds of weird and silly stories coming down through the, uh, through the jungle drums, as it were. Now, one of the things obviously lit my mind up was I was, I was going through a job spec sheet that was only open to MOD personnel. And one of the job spec sheets was at Pystock, which was an area located, which is now, uh, Pystock, I believe, is now where this building, this um, place where the guys at Beams are talking about. Um, oh, Kinetic. Yeah, yeah, the Kinetic. It was there, or just adjacent to that. Now, at, um, at Pystock, they were doing a lot of, um, they were doing a lot of uh, re-engineering, all that kind of stuff oh. with recovered aircraft. And on this job spec sheet, it said reversed engineering on recovered aircraft. Now, that could mean anything. It could be, you know, a captured MiG or a, or a, you know, a Korean jet fighter or something like that. It could have been anything. But it kind of lit my eyes up when I thought, oh, this is interesting because it's at Pystock. Now, they don't, didn't normally do that kind of stuff at Pystock. It wasn't a re-engineering platform there. But the whole area was very synonymous with weird stuff in the skies. Now, I'd seen all sorts of, should we say, weird anomalies of lights in the sky when I was younger. Mm. Um, and then when we did come back down from Yorkshire um, and we did end up uh, living back in Aldershot again, as my stepfather was based in Borden, um, I had a little job um, r ripping out the old electrical wiring from the um, Royal Air Force Air Show, the, um, the famous Farnborough Air Show. That oh, yeah. Was, at that time, was only running every other year. So when the job came along, it was loads of money, brilliant overtime. We were there <laughs> ripping out all the wires, making lots of money out of selling the copra. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. I didn't say that. But um, <laughs> we're having lots of fun, lots of money. Now, we used to see all kinds of uh, weird 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 light sightings um all over the pie stock area which is now the kinetic area yeah oh, so when right. you look at the kinetic grounds from yeah. above if you were to look at the, the from a like a google earth kind of yeah. imagery coming down the way that they've shaped the buildings and the roads sure, and everything huh? it's very strange and one part of it actually looks like an alien's head it does it does well, also, uh, the canopy over the front door looks like a UFO. That's right. If you, if you look at it, it does. Now, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> obviously, someone's having a bloody good laugh here. And uh, they're going, oh, I know what we're going to do. We're going to make that look like this now and just see what people do and say. Well, um, it, yeah. It, it's clearly done on purpose. I, mm -hmm. I mean, and sending a message out to somebody. Oh, yes. Because Quite interesting they, as well, um, yeah. talking about on a, on a cryptid note now, in the same location, before it was kinetic, Hillary's, I'm going to call him, well, I'm, let's say it's, say it's a grandfather, I think it was a grandfather, who was head so. of the RAE there, he was head yeah. of that, um, as far as I can recall, um, and if he wasn't head, he was sec deputy head anyway, um, so he was driving with his wife, and I don't think on duty, along um, now, she would be able to say much better, but along the edges on the outer perimeter of um, that whole area, and they were just going from A to B on the way home, and it was later-ish in the evening. It might have been about 11. She might tell this story as well. I can't remember if she does or not. And anyway, the next thing they both know, and there's nobody else around, it's just, and it's pitch black because there's just woods around. And the next thing they see is this, I think it's like a white figure, but it's like it's like a dog man. Mm. It's like a dog man creature, mm. bipedal, running, keeping up with the car. Mm. And the woman, his wife's beginning, her aunt or, or great grandmother, whatever, great great uh, aunt is beginning to freak out. Mm -hmm. And he's just and and so he's stepping on the pedal a bit. And this creature, whatever it is, is keeping pace. And he's just saying to her to calm her down. Don't worry, darling. Just, just, just ignore it. Just don't, don't do anything. Just don't, you know, don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, eventually they lose it. Mm. But I mean, this is another huge 
it, it, you know, in the south of England. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. My yes. goodness. Absolutely. And that, that area there is that area there is called Rushmore Arena. Ah. Yeah. And uh, it's a training ground for the for the for the army and, and for anyone that wants to come in and do it. The, that rings uh, a bell, actually. I think you're. Okay. I think you're in the same, we're in the same place. Yes, absolutely. Now, just off of Rushmore Arena, between Farnborough and all the shots, um, there's an area there called Queens Park, which has got a. It's a very famous, well-known place where the famous Red uh, Red Devils parachute team used to practice. Oh, they'll, they'll be jumping mm. out of their balloon and you know what have you doing yeah. all the smoke from our ankles, all the routine, just doing their practice thing. So we used to get a bit of a free jolly watching these guys. Yeah. Um, but no, it wasn't just us that was watching them. I mean, we oh. would often <laughs> say, "What's that up there?" Well, it's silver. It looks a bit solid, and it's stationary. Uh -oh. And it's just watching what we're watching. And that would happen quite often. But the Rushmore Arena thing was is just off of this area here now, Joanne. So um, oh, that's very the whole thing, yeah, the whole thing is with this. It had um, a lot of sightings of cryptid. Oh, really? Um, I can know that. So, oh, there wow. be, so we, we used, in all the shop, we used to have the airborne division. I don't know if they're still there or not. But anyway, mm. the paras, paras, parachute regiment used to, uh, they, they used to do their basic training there, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, they would often have to go out and do their, you know, their, their runs with full kits off down into Rushmore Arena. Now, some of the stories that used to come out when these, I'm going to call them squaddies for the use of a better name because yeah. that's all I knew. When these squaddies came out of their first six weeks worth of lockdown, I mean, when you first go into the army, well, back mm -hmm. in the day at least, you did six weeks basic training. You weren't allowed out. So when you were allowed out, you just let your hair down, whatever hair you let you have anyway. They just <laughs> let you have to let it down and blow your socks off. And there used to be a few pubs that you just didn't go into all the shot because you knew there would be trouble. But there would be a few pubs that you'd be able to go into and me being a young guy, me and my mates all having a few beers, you know, and chatting, chatting to these squaddies who would tell us about the experience they had in Rush Marina where they would see these, they quote, I quote, werewolves. Oh, really? As they're on manoeuvres. Now, you know, we've all had a few beers. Wow. Well, so I'm not too sure if I heard that right. Two. Am I sure that they said that right? You know, are they completely wasted? It wasn't the only time we heard it. We heard this story a few times by a few, as you can imagine, after these six weeks, they they all go off to their to their um, regiments and yeah. get posted wherever they got to get posted. So the new load of recruits come in. Six weeks later, they're let <laughs> out, right? And yeah. bugger me, they've got the similar kind of story. Now, there was a film made of this and it and it starred do you remember john pertwee the actor old doctor who yes it's his son was in the film oh right that was actually based upon this kind of thing but they actually made it into a more i've forgotten the name of the i think it's called dog soldiers or something like that oh, and right. it's based upon the, really? but yeah but they've obviously took it to the next level then werewolves are killing all the squaddies oh. now okay that didn't happen but you know it's that's what that film's based upon. It's based and you know upon when when you heard well. that, were they talking about just the odd one? Cryptid no, 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 no. They were saying that uh, because the area of Rushmore Arena. I'll just quickly explain. It's it uh, it is a bit of a as it says. It's an arena. It's it's uh, they used to do a lot of um, rope to rope stuff between the trees, okay, all yeah. that kind of aerial <laughs> combat kind of stuff. But also at the back of the arena there. Um, it, it's very clay, very sandy, clay kind of soil as well. And uh, they used to get them out there, send them out through the night for their orienteering map, map mm. reading. And they get lost. <clears throat> so now I know what that's like. I've done that. I've got lost. <laughs> now, when you're lost and you see these things running across the open plain, not, not covered by any trees, just open plain, you think it's one of your men or, or a part of your troop. Now, I didn't experience this. I'm being told what I've been told. I'm just relating yeah. what I've been told. They'd experience these bipedal things running across, but in a crouched manner. So they're thinking, oh, it's one of our, it's a load of our guys trying yeah. to take cover. And so they realized that it wasn't their guys. I mean, their guys are right with them. 
So um, did, did did they see two, three, or four in a group? Yeah, thing? in did some they... cases, up wow. to half a dozen. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow! Wow. Okay. But, um, wow. Yeah, they got into how... a fair amount of trouble for it too, from what I believe. Yeah, things were hushed up. But that that whole area there was also from a, a, a crossover paranormal kind of crossover thing as well. Was also a um, they called it Caesar's Camp because it was an old Roman um, uh, century camp where they okay. would stop on one of their route marches or through, you know, yeah. uh, trying to dodge Bodicea probably. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, they <laughs> that's what they would do. They would set up camp. And this thing, rather like a lot of these Roman, uh, uh, you know, uncoverings, yeah. had, uh, they found all sorts of things up there, you know, weapons and coins back in the day, and they closed it all off. So the squaddies knew not to go there. So when they saw these creatures, shall we say, running through that area, knowing full wow. well we shouldn't really be in there. What are they doing? Um, you know, well, how, how, how amazing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's, it's quite interesting, too, because um, just, and I don't know what this was. This wasn't crypt. Well, it is, I think you'd call it cryptid. Um, so an experience that was telling me, and this would be, oh, golly, I think this might be in the 80s. Um, so this is a, a, an experience, uh, an artist lady who recounted this story of how she was up in the in the Midlands somewhere and she and some pals decided that they were going to run off to for, for a bit of fun, go down to Glastonbury. It was already evening, but by the time they got there, it was about 11. And they 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 got over the, the wall or whatever. They got into Glastonbury. And they weren't being, being awful or anything. They were just really having a great time looking around. Nobody else there. It was all dark. And um, and this lady was telling me that she, as she was looking up, she thought she saw something, you know, in the sky moving and, and then was transfixed with that for a little bit. And then, now I haven't been to Glastonbury for a very long time, so I can't really remember what, what it looks like inside, but she said there are some very, very tall walls there, mm -hmm. really, really tall. And she said all of a sudden she became aware of something just off to the right. And as she turned round up on this wall, was a very tall caked figure okay. she said she said honestly she said what it looked like was um like one of the old dracula high collared capes oh yeah with a, an old black i don't know why everything has to be all black all black and and as she sort of kind of stood riveted because by this time so she was with two, two other friends and they'd all just gone off you know in their different directions just to have a wonder and have a an, ex, an explore and um and and so she wasn't near her pals and she just you know looked back looked up and she said this thing just opened its arms and it, like it fell forward but it didn't fall it swooped oh, to wow. land she said within about 40 feet of her and she couldn't see, because it was very dark she couldn't actually see any features and then she said she realized it wasn't actually on the ground it was sort of hovering it was sort of just off the ground. And then uh, two friends came back yeah. and were, 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 oh, my God, we've just seen. And they saw this guy, this being, and they said they'd just seen somebody exactly like that. So maybe there were two of them. Okay. And um, and then <clears throat> she got a torch in her hand. And one of them said to her, put the torch on, put the torch on, put, you know, shine the torch on it. And as she went to do that, it sort of did a, a, a kind of Star Trek shimmer. And it, and it suddenly was way distant back of them, you know. So, and then it, it just sort of disappeared. Now, the interesting thing about that is I was, I was, t I was doing some um, gym work at that time with a guy who, who was ex-military, really brilliant, you know, kind of boot camp gym. Uh, it was a lot of fun. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> no, but he, I don't um, think I could do with that anymore. No, no, no. It, it, well, it was really good. But anyway, he was a really open, open minded person. And I just said to him about this story. He said, ah, he said, well, that's interesting. He said, because because, of course, it's not far from Salisbury Plain, where there's a lot of military activity, of course, and training. And um, and he said there was something what they call it. They oh there, there's you know i've forgotten there was a creature that was and he said oh, but 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 he said maybe this is the military putting out the story so nobody goes on to salisbury plain uh you know so they keep off uh, uh and he mentioned about how there was something called the it's like an animal i can't remember something like the i want to say the hog's head creature 
something like that where it had the head of a hog but it, oh, okay. it but something some i think that i've got the right thing because i thought that's really weird a hog said well wh why not you know but um but apparently in in his story what he'd heard is that if anybody came into contact with this thing you didn't live now clearly these 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 guys lived that they they were just freaked out um and the, the weird thing was that after all that had happened and they were all going ah, what the heck was that and everybody had forgotten about what was up in the sky they just got themselves out and off to you know i, I don't know if they'd already got a b, &B organized or whatever but anyway but they said this police car came really really slowly by them she said it was a bit weird it was like what are they doing and they didn't didn't stop it was like they were casing them and and maybe observing what they were going to do after what had happened yeah but they said it, that was almost as bizarre the way the police behaved if it was police as, as to these strange beings yeah. so how about that again yeah. more, more weird things in england eh absolutely it's all frequency as as joy would say our, our good colleague and friend joy who will be on the show tomorrow will say it's all frequency and i think a lot of that has a lot to do with stuff for, for sure for sure it is for sure it is it's well, like we're going to keep that military thing going joanne because i've got your book here there you go absolutely oh, brilliant oh, read yeah fantastic read just let me stick that up on the screen here guys because um there we go this is the book uh, Joanne wrote this a little while ago, 44, um, there we go, An Ex-Soldier's True Story. And uh, yeah, the book is available now, the descriptions of where to get it are in the, uh, well, the links of where to get it, I should say, are in the descriptions below. It's available through um, Amazon, isn't it? That's yeah, where it's, it's, it's that's basically, where it's to be honest, I, I, I didn't do anything else with it than, than Amazon just to get the work yeah. done and out there and... Um, well, it's, it's yeah, really right. so so Bill Brooks, I, I spoke to him recently. Well, I, speak, yeah. I spoke to him reasonably regularly, and um, he had another series of strokes, and so he's not a well bunny at all. And um, I think I said to you when I did my own uh, radio show back in 2014 in October, mm -hmm. um, Bill had um, recently died yep. and had been resuscitated, and I'm laughing because he's such a... He's a small gentleman, but he is so tenacious. That willpower is what has kept him on the planet, you know, thus far. And when he came out of the resuscitation process, of course, he's got two big guys pounding on his body. He thinks he's being attacked, so he's coming up like this, you know, little guy. Oof, oof. <laughs> you gotta love him you gotta love him it is a great book i'm about that way through that's where i've earmarked it i'm about that oh, way yeah. through now i'm what getting chapter, there i am getting there. are you on yeah um where are we i'm on <laughs> yeah uh crikey what page what page what <laughs> 294 no I, i'm not sure what chapter covers 294 uh, but... chapter chapter 14 oh yeah I, I couldn't i didn't tell you without my notes under me what chapter 14 is now without it's really great i'm not going to give nothing away guys you've got to get this book it's amazing but what i will ask from joanna is a, a brief synopsis of what this book is all about because it is amazing i have started reading it and i just can't I, put it i down. think it is amazing and it's the, the reason i spent you know a lot of my life about three and a half years <laughs> you know writing it up because it was very difficult so so bill brooks is the pseudonym you know guess what no no prizes for guessing it's a pseudonym yeah. Now, um, I came across, just as a, as a preamble to what I'm about to say, uh, an old piece of uh, PR stuff that I was doing for the MASH project, and I never did use. But part of that, which I'm, I'm going to put out, it's um, a camera over the shoulder of me talking to Bill yeah. about um, what had happened to him when he was on, on board craft. He's been on board craft once, consciously, as a child, he was invited right. on by the play Pleiadian folks anyway and he was he had a memory comeback and he was on Skype so we see him and his camera was never very good so we don't get a great view of him but anyway so so I said to him look and I'm going to get back to the 2014 thing in a second I said look how how do you feel now about being associated with your the name you're known about in known by in the world and what do, how do you feel about your image being associated with with everything now and he said yeah i'm okay with it 
because the reason that he was so scared was because he'd had some horrible experiences at the hands of humans, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, which which were um, you know challenging to say the least. A lot of stuff involving Freemasons, which can be very dangerous for a being. Yeah, and yeah. he had a son, and he didn't. He was very scared that his son, you know, might there might be some detrimental uh, fallout. Anyway, as things have gone on. Uh, it, it's it's been okay. So um, so people may know his name already because it is out there. It was never meant to be out there publicly, but I didn't do that. But it's uh, well, in the latter times we we did. But it's Mike Smith, and so I will be showing some images of him and doing a little follow up video on some material. I've got so much footage, good, some good. fantastic good. footage, because I did all the um, field trips and just going back to the 2014 thing and him being resuscitated and fighting back. So he's already died, died once and um, had it, another series of strokes. And so I, you know, I don't, he can't play his guitar anymore, which is really sad, but, but he did, he did, <laughs> he's just so funny. When he came onto the show back in 2014, it was the week after he died. And I had him on as my recently deceased guest. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. A week after he died, he's back on the radio. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely amazing. This is an amazing book, guys. You've got to get it. You've got to get it. You really have. Um, just to give you a little overview of some of, the, the story, so, so Bill grew up in poverty in, in the West Midlands, black country yeah. uh, kind of area. And it seems that from the get go, from about two or three years old, he was an experiencer. He'd been abducted yeah. <clears throat> and had some very freaking bizarre, weird things happen to him. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that Bill as a person, or Mike, Mike Smith, <laughs> I've got so used to saying Bill, uh, yeah, yeah. Mike, um, uh, he, he's as a personality, but I think because of the difficulties of his early life and poverty and having to just, uh, you, you know, make life work. And it was all very tough mm -hmm. that he was, um, you know, blacks, black, whites, white, and there's nothing in the middle. So there, there are no ETs. There is no paranormal. There are no ghosts, you know, what the hell? And um, I mean, really, he would fight you on it. He's that, he was that kind of a guy. He said, you wouldn't have liked me back then. <laughs> But anyway, so when he was 44, which is why it's part such a big part of the, the cover title. Yeah, yeah. He had after a after a, he's, he's so he spent a, a, most of his adult life as a as a musician, gigging musician in clubs, pubs, you name it, all the rest of that. And he was coming back over the Berwyn Mountain, which I've been over that place now a good few times with him because he had quite a bit of missing time and so we went and actually traced that time it was actually 26 miles so That's he thought it was right. yeah so and and that was after this gig and um right. he didn't even remember as he was coming home and he was about to have what happened um, what, what i'm going to tell you about now he he was coming over and he said i've got a big old um what are they is it the audi that had the long big bonnets at one time Old stuff. So this was only back in 94, it wasn't that 100 years ago, but anyway, he had a big old car right. with, with a big old long bonnet. And right. the reason I'm mentioning that is because he said, not at the beginning, but he saw this uh, outline of a UFO and it seemed to be following the contours of the Berwyn Mountain. Right. And for yeah. anybody who doesn't know about the Berwyn Mountain, back in 73, there was an alleged UFO crash, mm -hmm. not far from the area we were. he was driving past. That's right. Anyway, isn't that interesting? Hmm? Mm. So he sees this UFO and then immediately forgets it and then doesn't remember anything for 26 miles till he's virtually outside his front door. When he's outside his front door, not right, 50 right. yards away from his house, is this massive conical structure, which is right. clearly a UFO. And he was an electrics guy in the army. He was in the, uh, you know, electrics and uh, amongst other things. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and he um, he was he said I was standing within ten foot of it. I said, "Did you touch it?" He said, "No, no. It looked like it was giving off electrical sparks." I didn't yeah. <laughs> touch it. But this, I mean, he said I must have stood there for about twenty minutes or ten minutes, twenty minutes. I can't remember watching, just watching it, and then right. went in, forgot all about it, and then and then he had a download. Now a download by that we mean like a near-death experience where the movie plays out. I've never had this experience, but I've read a lot about near-death experiences. And this is how Mike, Bill, says it happened to him. Mm -hmm. And he saw, and bearing in mind, now this is a guy does not believe in anything. 
And suddenly he sees all his life, except this time, well, not this time, but it includes everything from all his abductions from two to three years old, all the way through. And he's like, oh, he's on. like, oh my God. And, and he said, but the seriousness of it is, is that it sent him through a psychological traumatic loop. And he became an alcoholic for at least two years. Just he thought he thought he'd lost it. He thought he was mm. having a mental breakdown. He thought he must be mad. He, he unknown situation. And then when his lady got up the next morning, she found him going around in circles, going, I've, "I've been abducted. I've been abducted." She went, "What? Last night?" He went, "No, all my life, all my life, I've been abducted. Oh my god, oh my god." I mean, like a crazy man, crazy man. He just he couldn't. Nothing could prepare him because. A lot of experiences are a little bit more elastic in their mind and thinking than yeah. somebody like Mike Smith, Bill. Mm -hmm. So well, consequently, was... they shattered his mind. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, when you've done a certain amount of military training, you know, and you've done all your training, you've done your... I mean, the first six weeks, as I was saying earlier on, with a lot of these squaddies, when they first did the first six weeks, it is a certain amount, and I'll use this expression very loosely, brainwashing. Of, of conditioning these guys and women to, uh, to you know... Do as they're to told. <laughs> they've got to follow the code, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then as you go through, it's the mantra. It's the way that you're, you're, you're treated within the... Especially the army, more so, I feel. Uh, the way that you're treated, the way that you're conditioned, the way that... Because you've got to follow orders. You've got, to, you've got to do as you're told. You've got to be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing well, without any question. Well. Hmm. Exactly. So for, for him to actually then realise, hold on a minute, you know, something isn't quite right here and he's... Not you know, quite he right. He's oh, God, his yeah. whole life fell apart. His whole MK life. MKUltra, it, it says on the on the uh, the bit here, that, uh, yeah. MK Ultra and all sorts of bits and pieces like that. ET element, including MK Ultra, MK Ultra type programming. Porting down. <laughs> Porting down, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um absolutely paranormal beings the whole nine yards it's all oh my, um, oh my god amazing. i mean it, it is phenomenal what that guy's been through considering he's a guy who couldn't be less interested i mean i, I know a lot of experiences start out and they they just it's not a field of interest it's just mm. something that happened to him but this guy is not only not interested he he would walk the other way i mean and he would i mean as he said to me i would have thought anybody like you jam was a complete fruitcake complete well, fruitcake yeah. Uh, um, not now, uh, not now, <laughs> not now. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, but I've seen you deal with fruitcakes, so I don't think, <laughs> so I shouldn't have said that. Um, but uh, still, nonetheless. Um... It's it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. And a lot happened to Bill in the army. He was only, I mean, he didn't even get to be on the passing out parade. I mean, I don't know right. if you want me to talk about that or, yeah, go for or it. any yeah. other part yeah. of it, but. Well, just on the <laughs> Bill, I mean, it was like they, they're thinking, what can we do to him next? Yeah. <laughs> Break yeah. him out. And so it, during the six weeks training, he was in Woolwich. And um, on, on I think it was the day before they were parting out. So, the, you know, the, the CEO, whoever it was, had them, you know, doing the last gym bit. And, and what he was doing was he was going up one of those, you know, massive ropes shimming up there. And it was anchored to, um, I think, a metal platform at the top or a joist, something like that. I mean, you know, that wasn't going anywhere. And, you know, you probably know they're as heavy as heck, right? They're, I mean, I, I'm by the seaside and those ropes that they use for pulling in the tugs and everything. I mean, I can hardly lift one end, let alone the rope. Gosh. So those things are really, really heavy. So here's young Bill, 18 years old, just about to pass out on parade for the next day. And he goes up, gets up the top and he's just hooking one of his hands over when all of a sudden, now imagine this, everyone, imagine this. The rope loses gravity, how? And winds itself round his little neck. Now he's not a six foot five bloke. He's probably five, seven and very slender. And it, what, and, and this is beginning to strangle him. And it carries on strangling him and he, He's caught. He's a, he could expire seriously any minute. And then suddenly, for whatever reason, the rope loses gravity once again, having wrapped itself around his neck and goes back to its normal state. So he gets himself down the rope. Now, you might say, oh, what a load of 
beep beep yeah well you would wouldn't you except that he had all this um horrible um welding well um what do they call it uh welt like welt, welt. Yeah, welt, welt welt yes yeah. a welt not not welch welt uh, of the injury and he was actually sent to hospital it was so yeah. bad and it was very painful and so and actually, um, he couldn't do his uniform up because he couldn't, nothing could go around his neck. It was so painful. Yeah. So he was actually not allowed to be out on his own passing out parade because they <laughs> insisted on the uniform. I mean, they did pass him out technically. He just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do it yeah. in the uniform. Yeah. 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 How about that? And then how about this? Shall I, shall I wrap that? This is, this is really amazing now. So bear in, hold, hold the mic, Smith, experience with the rope losing gravity. I mean, I would like anybody out there to tell me how that's done. He doesn't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. And nobody saw anything. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. So then, when, so, when, so he was 18 when this happened. Well, back in, um, so about, oh, I'm trying to think. So a few years earlier, so I don't know. I'm trying to think. So I'm talking about now a different Mike, a Mike Oram, who's on the album. And I mention this because there's a very similar situation because I left one of the books with Mike when I was doing an interview with him for the Eclectia documentary. And Eclectia is an album uh, featuring experiences for those who don't know. We'll and up in a Mike, bit. Yep. Mike rang me and said, and, and so when I left him, I said, because he's, just like me, he's a bit of a bookaholic, but you don't always get to read them. I said, and don't forget you, read that book. I'd like to know your feedback. And he said, John, I read the book. You can't believe it. I went, what? He said, I've just had a memory come back. He said, it wasn't a lost, lost memory. It's just something that had been out of my head all these years. And he said, it was when I was about eight years old. And, and Mike is uh, from London and he was living uh, in a, a I think in Essex somewhere in a very small house. And he said, what my dad did, he said, I don't know why he did this. He said, because I've never been somebody who likes, you know, kind of fighting or anything like that. But he put up the equivalent of a punch bag, you know, filled it with stuff really, really heavy and over the kitchen door frame. So, you know, when nobody was walking about, I don't know whether he did or he did it for his boy or whatever, Mike Oram. Um, and, and when it wasn't in use, it would just be hooked around some some little hook to the side in the hallway. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, on this day, Mike is, um, he thinks, oh, I don't know, a bit fed up. He thought, oh, I'll have a little bit of a punch. His dad's out in the garden. His mum's wherever she's off. His sister's not around. And so he starts having a little punch at the back. <laughs> and uh, so this is an eight-year-old child. And then all of a sudden, guess what? The entire punch bag loses gravity and the rope or the string. Now, he said it's like washing line string. So very strong. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not, of course, thick like the rope that you shimmy up in the in the gym. Like a nylon type of. Uh... It might have been more of a string string, but even oh, okay. so, they're, they're pretty strong. But anyway, yeah. this, this thing has coiled itself round his neck. And now it's getting to the point where he's losing consciousness. Mm. And all of a sudden his dad comes in, sees what's happening, thinks young Mike is messing around. I mean, A, <clears throat> young Mike couldn't even lift the bag. It was so heavy. Mm. So there's no way to get enough slack on the rope, which he's punching the bag at his height. Get this, folks, at his height. So he would have to lift it up, be on something much taller for it to get round his neck. How does that happen? No. Wow. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, so this is a, well, reading this book then brought these, obviously brought the memories back. Oh, that it's memory a bit back. Of a, yeah, so yeah, we've got that. And, yeah. So that, that's in the Mike Oram uh, interview, supplementary. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. It is, it, so, it is amazing. So there's, I tell you what, the Mike, the Mike Smith story is so complex. It's so, mm. there's so much of it. A lot happened to him in the army. Yeah, yeah. It, I, um, I'm getting that. I'm really. I, I don't want to rush this book because each time I go to read it, Joanne, I'm, I'm I'm loving it so much, and I'm just like getting to that point, and then something else happens, and it's like, okay, I've got to go and do this or that or the other. That's how course, this life yeah. is, isn't it? I, I but know. um, it's it's a great book. Look now, Joanne. I don't know if you can see this, but Joanne's basically signed this for us because <laughs> this book is going to be on our giveaway. Well, not giveaway on our raffle on December the 21st, because uh, all of these books that we've got here, one here from uh, 
from past guest Alan Godfrey. We've got a load here from uh, Preston Dennett as well. Loads of books. Uh, Cheryl Costa. And we've got some stuff from um, Philip Mantle as well. Some really good books. And uh, all these are going to be raffled off on the 21st of December. I just need to give us a pick quick plug and uh if you uh we will be um ramping this kind of campaign up um in the next couple of weeks and of course all of the uh, the the tickets for this raffle all of the money for the tickets to this raffle uh go to mental health trust it's uh no, it's it's called mental health trust um and uh all for good mental health which i think is uh is that a nationwide mental health it trust? is a nationwide actually Lovely. yes it's a nationwide um uh, charity uh, that deal with a great deal of uh, research and such for uh, good mental health basically um mm -hmm. just about everybody i'm talking to in these invited shows and the added extras and all the other things that we do and on the radio as well there's always a mental health aspect either yeah. they're suffering from or they know somebody who is and obviously, without getting political here and uh, whatever your political persuasions are, I'm not even going to go there with anyone. But especially at the moment, ladies and gents, with everything that's going on with lockdowns or even proposed threatening lockdowns, whatever you want to believe, it's still a stressful time. And people are losing their jobs. People are losing money. They can't earn bits and pieces. And I tell you what, it's a life changer these last couple of years. And more and more people are going downhill. Now, if there's any which way that, that I can do to help this, then that's what I'm doing by raffling up these books. And good people like Joanne and others sign the books and we're going to be raffling them off. Uh, and this will be on the 21st, the longest, sorry, the shortest day of the year. Um, well, we're going to do a special show and we're going to raffle them off live on air. So uh, if you haven't bought That'll your ticket, be fun. do it. Yeah, it's going to be a good one, I think. It's going to be a good one. Is so it going to be your Christmas party? It's going to be kind of, yeah, I think we Your might have some silly party. hats. Yeah, yeah, funny noses, silly hats, and, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing more than usual. Uh, <laughs> so I want to move on to the next project you've got, and this is the project you've got going on right now. And this is something, ladies and gents, it's quite exciting, because I know a lot of you know that I'm, you know, do a bit of music we, we, we used to do quite a bit of music we got a radio station we got our recording label kicking off you know psychotica studio is a studio so as well as liking and and supporting and what have you about the weird and high strangeness of things that are going on we're very much advocates of brand new music and supporting and promoting music as well so what joanne's got here it's a very interesting concept it's called i'm going to put it up on it because it's all glary here let me just stick it up on the screen here we go. Eclectia. Now then, I'm going to let Joanne explain exactly what this is all about because she made some references to it through the show already. And uh, we're just going to give Joanne a bit of a platform to really go for this because it is an amazing concept. Uh, so CD details available in descriptions below. Please go and check them out. Right, Joanne, what's it all about? What's Eclectia all about? Well, Eclectia, as you have rightly said, is an album and it is in the physical, though it's not being sold in the physical at the moment, simply because, actually, if you, could you open it and show everybody? It's what still wrapped because we're going to oh. do it as a part of the prize. Uh, uh, okay. So well, I didn't want to unwrap it. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I'll, I tell you what, we'll, I'll have to send you uh, the pictures at some other time to, to drop in because the okay. images of the CDs themselves, yeah. it's a double CD, are yeah. beautiful and the guy on the front of the album, I don't know if you can put that up again. Yeah, stick, and I just I'll want to describe the guy who's created. So the guy in, so on the left, underneath, um, so you've got Marie, you've got Betty and Barney Hill, and then you've got a, a guy in a waistcoat. Now that's Dan Vallely. Uh, mm -hmm. He's on his left are three ETs there. And he is the designer of this amazing album, which of course is uh, based on the Sergeant Pepper uh, uh, iconic album except mm. um, there's myself in the middle in the, with the red uh, with the ET newsroom presents and everybody who's on the album is also featured here somewhere and Dougie the guy with his hand on his chin and the grey jacket also near the drum there was my partner in crime on this sadly he he is no longer with us he mm. um, left the planet uh, a month after we finished the album, but he said, oh my God, Joanne, the first time I've listened to it without my tech ears on, because he did a lot of the 
um, tech side on the music, um, if, if you like, levels side of things. Yeah. And um, he thought it was brilliant. Now, the album is by genre of person unique. So the criteria for getting on the album is that every contributor is a, a mus mostly they're musicians, uh, but there's 19 representations on there, including myself. I'll tell you about that a bit later if we get time. But they've all had either experiences uh, close and personal with ET or craft sighting, something that's changed their lives entirely and or including paranormal and spiritual. So it's quite a, a broad remit for the criteria to be on the album, but this is volume one. And I'm hoping that we will do volume two, three, and maybe it will just continue. So the album itself musically is different in that not only is the genre of musician different, i.e. Mm -hmm. let's say their experiences, but um, that I've also got spoken word on there. And what I asked most of the people to do was to give a, a one to two minute um, little overview of what the kernel of their experience was. And so you've got that in their own voice before their song. And it is, I find it riveting even today. I listen to that and I get goosebumps when I listen to those guys. And then we've got one or two people who are, who are they've got Chris Bledsoe giving a little bit of a story about his meeting this E.T. I don't know whether she's an ascended master. I don't know whether she is E.T., but she certainly is very high vibration. Mm -hmm. And she, I, and when when I was when I was speaking to Chris and trying to get this interview down for the album, we had it was like pulling hen's teeth. We had all kinds of technical difficulties, as if the world, something in the world, didn't want me to have that interview out on this album. I'm telling you, so it, it's not. It is my. It is the worst interview on there for, for technically, but I had to put it on because it was of yeah. his voice. That's but anyway, I mean. I mean, you can hear it, but it, it is just not so great technically. But the message from the lady who he calls the guardian was the message is in the music and this message actually was aimed at grant cameron who also speaks about his book tuned in the paranormal world of music because he had this um impulse to write about this and this was based on the back of uh michael luckman who wrote alien rock yeah whether you have that book there but I, I have it i never thought to bring it to camera but uh, alien rock is is about some of the amazing very high profile musicians mainly who all had et experiences including right. elvis yes i knew yeah, elvis yeah. Had to be one. Yeah, yeah. oh you know when i heard that when, when i read that i thought oh yes <laughs> I of course, knew it. john lennon all the usual suspects of course the who yeah, yeah. and oh my yeah, god yeah. so yeah, so yeah. many so um so uh, because it was, I mean, it was way before that I was doing my radio show, but Grant had introduced me to Meryl Fankhauser, who's mm -hmm. known as the uh, surf rock king. Right. <laughs> He's such, right. A, such a gorgeous person. Yeah. And he wrote Wipeout. And I am, you know, I'm not in the music business. I didn't know what Wipeout was. The moment I heard it, though, the moment I heard it, I thought, oh, of course, I, wow, of course I know it. It's a fantastic instrumental and I and I defy anybody not to know it. <laughs> you won't know the title necessarily. Awesome drumming on that one. It's amazing, isn't it? it really brilliant. It's amazing. And Meryl um, came on my radio show and told me some amazing stories. I'll save that bit for another time. Okay. But it was through all of that. And I had been thinking, so the album was released um, November 2018. And I had had this idea for at least, I don't know, three years maybe four years. I, I actually can't remember the moment that the idea kind of coalesced in me. Um, but it's like there's a musical that I wrote back in the late 90s <laughs> called Fifth Dimension, which, you know, I took two years out to do. And a couple of those songs, OK, they're musical songs. Uh, they're obviously the musical. Musical. lovely. Brilliant. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. They're on the album just because why not? It's my album and I why can do not? it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> so um, on the back to what kind of music is on the album, because uh, you know, mostly, you know, you'll buy an album because it's jazz or hip hop or whatever. But yeah. this is, you, it's like, it's like a lucky dip. It's so exciting yeah. because you get people like John Martin, who is this most amazing classical guitarist who mm -hmm. actually played for Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, John was very kind in allowing me to read on the album a letter he'd written to Jimmy Carter telling him 
about some of his most incredible experiences of um, ET, uh, of UFOs and mothercraft coming over his property since he was telepathically communicating with them um, harmoniously and then playing to them telepathically. How about that? I mean, how freaking amazing. And then we have people like Kevin Estrella in Canada. So jo uh, John Martin is in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, Kevin Estrella, who does um, guitar or metal guitar, brilliant stuff song of light i absolutely love it yeah, it's so love thrilling it. some of the music on here you know it's it's killer it really uh, yeah. is it's and then you've got, so it's an international compilation album as well so we've got people from the uk canada and america yeah. and everybody's brilliant so there's a bit of folk there's some pop and one of our uk guys a guy called gary white uh, gary williams brilliant, created yeah. a song called big white triangle because mm. Guess what? His life changed in 2009 when with his friend Chris in Luton, <laughs> he, you know, they've had an evening together with their families and they're just outside, you know, having a smoke, whatever they're doing. And all of a sudden this gargantuan big, big edifice of a white triangle, white triangle, not a black one this time, comes over. And it's it totally, totally changed the way yeah, he absolutely. thinks. Absolutely. And he and his band, which is called Justice Kane, write music specifically about you know all the mind control that's going on from the governments and all the rest nonsense that's going on now and and everything they've done some really great stuff but great big white triangle i checked him out on youtube actually it's very interesting stuff that they've got going on yeah yeah really, i, I really think i think it could be a number one i really do so and, how many tracks um, have we got on here joanne how many tracks i think, have we got? No, I think it's 19 not including right. um not including the the uh sound bites right okay so it's it's a two cd uh, yeah. situation 19 tracks not including the sound bites now this is something that i've got to chirp in with here is the the unique selling point as i like to call it with this is the sound bites because oh, it's amazing the stories absolutely the stories got me and i'm thinking oh my god just just the album with the stories on I would buy it just for that. Let alone there's the never fact been that it's anything, got the music as well. Absolutely yeah, there's never brilliant. been anything like it. This concept is is brand new. It's broken every kind of rule for, for creating an album. And I, you're I, causing a bit of a stir with this now. I mean, you've been on radio shows. I mean, Joe Woods had you on a radio show all that yeah, long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Ronnie Woods, uh, is it still his wife or ex-wife now? Ex-wife. Yeah. ex-wife of course she was and, great uh, yeah she said we should do a show together I think well she was yeah I, I listened to the podcast she was all over that wasn't she she yeah. was absolutely um yeah. or I said it. It. yeah yeah um and of course it's you know it's it's making good ground now you've got a website out I have put the link to the website it's in descriptions go and have a look whoops there we go knock the mic there's, about John while you're talking why not uh, there's, have a look in there's quite the a, a lot on the uh, collect your album and I will just say now that the etnewsroom.com website is under construction at the moment, so um, okay. it should be, it, sh it might not even be online at the moment. To be honest, I haven't even looked because it needed it was, a major, major revamp. So. It was at one o'clock this afternoon when I checked. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> anyway, it, it's going to have an entirely new look before the year goes out. So I'm okay. just saying that because it, it is quite a wordy thing. I come from well, words. Well, so here's the other thing, it. guys. Look. Um, I'm just going to point you in another direction, possibly then, in that interim period. I mean, it is a, a, a bit of a, a funny name to remember. Eclectia, okay, spelt with a K, E-K-L-E-C-T-I-A, Eclectia. If you stick that into Google, um, it will actually take you to different places, like, for instance, Bandcamp. Now, you know how Bandcamp works, ladies and gents, I'm sure. If you don't, then it's a pretty simple, straightforward platform. You you basically, what is it, a situation there? How much are you, you you're selling on Bandcamp for? It's a silly amount, isn't well, it? Uh, well, yeah, and I think the, you know, the thing is, is because you can buy tracks separately, you don't have to separately. buy the album, of course. Yeah, and yeah. You, so so this is, this is not an area I'm familiar with. And you think, well, how can that be? Well, it's just because the, the album basically is laying dormant since, because... What happened was that um, Dougie Degnan, who's also on the album with Another Good Thought um, as a song, which is also pretty brilliant in my view. I love it. Um, so we worked for a, a we worked for a year together, just under a year together. We actually completed the album within about nine months or a little bit less, according to my notes. But um, anyway, it was a phenomenal tour de force. He and really Dougie was it, yeah. uh, Dougie was very, very poorly. 
Mm -hmm. uh, during a lot of that, um, I don't think he knew to what degree he was so poorly. I mean, obviously he knew he was very poorly, but you know, we had periods when he was less poorly, let's put it like that. And, um, and I did some of my healing work with him and that was incredibly effective, but it didn't, you know, it clearly when your times come, your times come. And mm -hmm. he died of a massive stroke, um, and finally left on January the 1st, 2019. Okay. So he, he literally just had about, um, before the stroke, he had the stroke on, I think, Christmas Day. Mm. So, uh, and the album was released on um, the end of November, the 1st of December. So he literally, he hardly had a month, but he just adored it. And of course, he worked very hard on it. He would, he'd be over at my place. He was over in Brighton and he'd come over to me and sometimes bunk down and eat all, eat, eat all the sweets. <laughs> He's a sweet man. And then uh, we do our funny jingles together and just have a, a laugh doing that. Um, very funny. Very funny. Uh, yeah. And, you know, what, what an amazing, what an amazing person. And then he didn't get, he, his, big joy was all the PR and all the rest. I can't wait to, you know, really get rocking and rolling on the next phase of Eclectia because we well, were course, so exhausted. With, with, the, with the loss of Dougie, of course, it had um, it had a bit of, obviously it's going to, it had an effect on the production, it had an effect on everything else, the promotion, the, the Oh, marketing. yeah, everything, everything oh, stopped. Everything stopped. And then, it, of course, COVID and lockdowns, and it didn't really help much at all. Yeah, but. Yeah. We're moving on with this now. I think um, I think yes. I can uh, I think I can announce here that Zoe Studio is going to be getting involved. This is, this is like a formal involved. official announcement. Yay! Official, official. Should we do a fanfare? Um, <laughs> there we go. You did it better than what I was going to do, but it didn't work out for me. Um, so yeah, we're going to get involved with this. So we think this is a great little concept, a mover. It really is, and it's something that we're going to be pushing through our radio station at uh, Planet Zycotica Radio PZR and also uh, through our various channels and um, we're going to be having Joanna back as well on different shows and I think as well can we mention something that we've talked about just recently about possible possible inclusion of a certain well should we I'm just going to say it we oh, might wow. do we might actually do a show with you that's going to be a little bit out there and we're going to talk about oh. some of those subjects in a minute oh yes oh yes yeah, yeah absolutely because they, yeah. you thought ladies and gents that we've been on the cusp we've been on the cusp on the perimeter of hello then hold on stick around because we're going to get even weirder <laughs> um but yeah i just want to wrap this up on the album side of it this is it there we go let me stick it up on the doodar again because this is important guys this is you should be able to look at this all right um there we are. That's what it looks like. Go and have a check. Go and have a look. Um, what, it, what I'd, yeah, what I'd like it. to say as well is if people go and have a look at the gallery part, and the reason I'm pointing you to that is because there are some great images. And one of the images is of Dan Ballaly's brain implant. And not many people get an opportunity to see the brain scan of someone who's actually got an implant. And that is current. He has that implant. That was so, yeah, that was freaky. That was all. Yeah, yeah, amazing stuff. Amazing, yeah. amazing stuff. So um, there's there's a lot on there, and you can hear jingles, and you can you know listen to some of the early stuff that we did on the jingle stuff. And as I say, it just kind of sat there for a bit, and we tried to do quite a lot leading up to that. But yeah. you know, it wasn't the right time, and I think now is the right time. I think it you is. said John it's as right well, um, yeah. and I think so. You know, I I think so as well. I think that. Um, it's going to be a real incredible ride. And Dan, um, uh, you know, he did such a fantastic job on the entire graphic design of the inside cover, the discs. And we mm. hope eventually to have the discs, um, uh, the discs, um, the CD, physical CD for sale. And also maybe then what I said, so we've, so I've already created um, 10 episodes of um, the Brits, but the Brits element of a documentary of Eclectia, because right. some of the stories, guys, honestly, I mean, they are mind blowing. Not We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Before we do, I just need to say this, the album, this album, because it's still wrapped up and we, I was actually tempted. Shall I unwrap it and shall I show you all the bits in Oh, why not? Absolutely. Why I was not? going to, but, oh, hello. What have I done? I've got to pull things apart because I'm getting too excited, rummaging about. There we go. They're just they're just beautiful. They're works of you know, reason I'm saying this because they're works of art in themselves. Uh oh dear. 
has it flown on the floor but it's it's uh, you know this everybody's story from from everybody there's only two two ladies involved i'm one of them and devara thunderbeat in arizona is another and her story i mean just a, a little story a quick vignette is that since four years old she was taken and then with her mum as well as her mum was holding on to her one time and she was being taken and the the ets have said to her you have to heal with your music you have to bring in the healing frequencies and that is what devara has been doing so oh, amazing stuff people amazing amazing and some of the music's phenomenal you won't like all of it i'll, you know. I'll, I'll be honest with you um i like i a would lot. say there's a good 95 percent that got to me straight away and i'm really cheesy with my music i'm really yeah. I'm, um, <laughs> um so 95 percent of what's on here mate i've gone yeah um the others they're growers and when yes. you're getting an album, yes. you can't always say that. I mean, you know, it's always going to be, oh, I don't like that one. Oh, no. There's always going to be a track you skip. I haven't skipped any of these. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is going to be raffled off as well as a part of the prize. Yeah. Uh, so did, the, you, the did you get 25th. to open it or, or not yet? Actually, I've just had a little look. Here we go. Here we go. Now, this is open now, guys, but I will wrap it again. <laughs> um, there we are. That's the artwork. In there we go. Can we see that? Yeah, I think they're upside down, but it doesn't matter. You are can they? Still, oh, one is upside are. down, uh, but that, they're just beautiful. Cool, and the, <laughs> and this was, um, you know, this is also the work of there Dan Vallely, experiencer and musician himself. I mean, Look at that. beautiful. It's that's gorgeous. amazing stuff on there, isn't it? Look, that's, I just, that's awesome. I, I would just want it on my wall in a frame. I tell you. Well, I was going to say, yeah, put that on a frame and then go to Bandcamp and download it. <laughs> what? A, what? A, there we are. That look great in a nice little frame sticking up. On oh the yeah, end. I know. Really, I'm, I'm quite serious because I, I I like funky artwork like that. There we go. So uh, yeah, so great. Thanks so to that's Dan. Gonna be, that's going to be raffled off as well. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, documentaries. Because I pulled my earphone out and you were talking about something and. Um, I couldn't hear nothing for about two or three seconds. So <laughs> documentaries. Um, you were talking about the Brit side of the documentaries of the the uh, artists that you've had on this album. The eclectic documentary. Album. So I'm, yeah. it's just going to be associated with the album and there'll be a, a wonderful big book with all lovely photographs and the, the stories about, you know, the guys have shared <clears throat> and girls have shared, um, which will be beautiful. And we're hoping to do or I'm hoping to do as well, so, you know, some funky arty stuff like a uh, limited release of vinyls. Of course, we won't be able to get all the, everything on the vinyl, but I think that would just be so funky, so beautiful. Vinyl works. <laughs> that will work really well on a vinyl, a double gated vinyl, a bit like. Yeah, can you imagine? A yellowish kind of double gated vinyl. Oh, kind it of. would be fantastic. And so um, because the stories of these people are so astonishing and my work is involving you know, telling people stories and giving them a platform. You know, I I wanted as well to create the, the Eclectia documentary. So we've done the album and now the documentary is fast on its heels. I've already done the Brit side, which it, which involves 10 episodes, uh, 10 episodes, um, which um, six of those are Mike Oram's <laughs> a story. Like, because she his... doesn't hang about people. She gets <laughs> on with it. His Love story it. was so amazing. And then um, when I get to, I need, I want to, um, I want to interview the people in America and Canada in person, if possible. So uh, when that becomes possible, I, I will be doing that as well. And hopefully, you know, maybe by our association collaboration, we shall move things forward in the world uh, commercially with that as well. Well, we're going to get things amazing. moved. I mean, there are things that are going to happen here. I mean, you know, we, we've very a exciting of chatting offline, haven't we? We're, yeah. We've got a few ideas. We're going to kick some ass, I think, as it says. Uh, it's speaking a, of Grant a, Cameron, a we've got Grant Cameron kicking on and show in the back end of November. Oh, so how fantastic! He's such a, a great one. guest. Yeah, He's such a great guest. So maybe we could do something with Grant. I don't know. My head's ticking over. Anyway, uh, that's for another day. But um, yeah. yeah, absolutely amazing. So these documentaries, then, they're they're full on about the experiences that these guys that are, that are on your album, the full on experiences. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and, and Merrill Fankhauser, you know, he has been, <clears throat> he's over in California. He has been such a, a, an avid supporter of um, the concept 
and he's he's just really excited of course we've we've as you said with with this um global shenanigans global mm. takeover <laughs> going on uh, we haven't been able to go very far well, with it uh, that's the new name yeah. yeah it is that's what's happening that's what that's um, exactly what has been going on isn't it i mean yeah they're not taking me over but on everything hasn't it i mean the whole thing taking now. some people over but not me yeah <laughs> Absolutely. But um, but anyway, so Merrill, I mean, Merrill and his story, you know, his is amazing, some of his stuff. And I mean, uh, it's just such a joy and a privilege to have these folks share with you their incredible insights into the human experience via mm -hmm. the lens of E.T. Um, and how that has impacted their lives, because this is the thing, folks, I mean, it's changed their lives irrevocably forever in all all, all manner of ways um in all manner of ways and i find this very exciting it can also be challenging because it it's about breaking the status quo it's about you know that glass ceiling finally lifting in all kinds of layers of of mind set um it's not always easy no. um, <clears throat> and i i understand that and i just think we have to if we are kind, compassionate, open and loving, and if we don't, if it doesn't work for us, or we don't agree, or just put it on the shelf and just think, like I do, I just think, okay, I can't quite, I can't, that doesn't, you know, I don't see where that fits in anything at the moment. Let me, let me just put it on the back shelf for a minute. And I lo and behold, I totally agree. I, I can tell you what. to tell you how many times that I've done that because yeah. it's always good enough to work on, isn't it? It's always something yeah. there. It just doesn't quite fit that. Part yeah, of the and sometimes it doesn't come in for quite mm. a long time. It may mm. be even you know a year or two down the road. And you think, oh, hang on. When something comes barreling forward, you think, oh, that's yeah, where that that's fits it. in. Now it fits. It's as if that thing that's come barreling forward is meant to have done that. So you're. Yeah, it's like we need more information. Now fits in. Yeah. <clears throat> Often that's the thing because we only have through the lens a very tiny bit of information. You know, really of the whole. Of even the experiencer only has a tiny bit of information, you know. They have more than more than me, <laughs> you know. That interaction definitely, but um, it, it's still very, very limited and very managed, which is mm -hmm. the enormous mind management bit from the Mash project. You know how our perceptions are managed not only by ET, but by you know the higher self. That whatever contract, whatever agreement we came in with, if people think along those lines or or whatever other thing they want to um, graft onto that process of how we come to be in the conditions and situations mm. that we are. Mm. It is fascinating stuff, I tell you. It, it, it never a dull moment. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, never a dull moment. Well, I'm just going to plug this uh, up there one more time for the people that are watching and those coming back on YouTube at a later date. Hello to you if you are that person. Uh, CD details available in description below. Eclectia, there we go. It's the double album, uh, du album that show my age, double CD. Even that show in my age these days. What, what can't we call it an album then? Yeah, well, I suppose we could album. do, couldn't we? Yeah, I think I've, I tell you what. What I, else I, would we call it? I said to my daughter, I said, look at this album. She just looked at me and she went, oh what? Oh, oh really? Well, there you go. That shows you what I don't know. Yeah, I didn't the... know that things weren't called an album anymore. No, what, no, what do you call it? A music or what? Yeah, but, oh, what? A, an I album? Can't... It's an album, Del. Album. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but anyway, moving on. Yeah. You well, thought I, that I... we were. Th we we've got to a level here, Joanne, where we we're, we're going to move on to where we're going in the future. Well, where you're going in the future. I beg your pardon. What's on the horizons? What's kicking off? Because We've had a bit of a chat off air about, um, well, I'm just going to say Dow's in detectives. Oh, yeah. And that's just going to open up a cavalcade of all sides of bits and pieces, I'm sure. Because you've alluded to a few things that we're going to go into now as we've, as we've gone through the show. Well, and uh, I think <clears throat> it's an extremely exciting time as regards to um, where we're actually going with our development with, um, should we say, upping our vibrations, if we will. Uh, Absolutely. Looking at, as where we're Absolutely. going right now, as, 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 a, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a life force, uh, without trying to sound too new agey. Um, well, what, what, is this, uh, what is this whole thing with the, um, with the dowsing, with the dowsing detectives? Please well, give us a little <clears> bit <throat> of info on this. So, um, so I've been involved with a group of, uh, scientists, educators, 
people a small group um i think at the most <clears throat> they might be six eight or ten depending on um i've done lots of field trips over the years since about um gosh uh maybe 2012 i can't remember if i knew them then or they contacted me when i first started the match project anyway <clears throat> so one is um in tunbridge wells and the others are more in in the hertfordshire area mm. and the lead on that jeffrey crockford is also on the album because i've got some people just doing voice um little interviews on the album and uh, like grant just talking about the tuned in you know paranormal world of music of his book <clears throat> and how that fits in and then um jeff crockford who is the lead of a group that was known as the biolocation team which has virtually dissolved now in as much as uh, jeff sadly also left the planet um <clears throat> a year after dougie 2020 and um so he was a linchpin it's always it's always like that isn't it and yeah. um anyway so so for many years jeff's a scientist um well all the team are there's there's a retired um uh physicist that works with them and said oh my gosh i wish wish i'd known this when i was being you know in my employment anyway so <clears throat> basically these guys do a lot of remote viewing and then do field work dowsing mm. and and they they really weren't looking for ET, nothing nothing related to that. They were actually investigating ancient archaeology, ancient peoples. And they've written a couple of books. One's called The Secret of the Stones. That's by Jeff Crockford and Nigel Hughes. And The Phoenix Point, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is the latter book, again, mm -hmm. by, I think that's both of them again. And the Phoenix Point and as well as, well, the Secret of the Stones is more of a technical manual. It's a huge book, of almost about a quarter of a million words um, of uh, uh, how, how they have conducted their experiments. All this work was done with experiments. And <clears throat> through their field work, they came up with various uh, modalities and work conditioning, which, uh, so, for example, if they were looking for Actually, before I go a little bit too far, let me just say that the guys found they were inexorably led to the premise that ET are at the base of or at the core of this ancient archaeological findings that they were having. And this isn't just in the UK. This was in different countries. And... It, and, and this was astonishing to them because they had zero interest in actual the ET thing. But the more they found the ET thing, they began developing techniques via remote, remote, um, what would I call it? Sensing, hmm. remote viewing, sensing, um, communications. And they opened a communication uh, pathway between um, a group known that some people will know as the Galactic Federation, which is a, a group of, of uh, beings, <clears throat> different different beings who come together for the common good of all. And I don't mean that like in a communistic sense. I mean that in, in like a protective sense. And they began to experience real time real interaction with these beings in the magnetic field. Now, the human being has a magnetic system, um, paramagnetic, diamagnetic, and the ferromagnetic element works with the, with the mind. <clears throat> and it's very interesting because we are so sensitive to the magnetism that we can actually quite easily read it if we learn how to do that, you know, or even think we can do it because th this was all new to me. And I had, uh, th this was a wonder world. Anyway, um, the guy who I also was doing a lot of work with was, was brought into the group on, on occasion. But because there was this group in Hartford, he was often working alone and then feeding in remotely to them. And his work was always validated. Now, this guy, his name's Peter Vincent, and he is the protagonist in my series called The Dowsing Detectives, which is not just about dowsing, it actually should have and remote viewing in there because 
it's um, he does the, the same kind of thing and he works directly with an extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, honest to goodness, this is so amazingly out there. It's phenomenal. But Peter has been tested many times on the validity or veracity of his of his work. Mm -hmm. And so far, he's been proven correct. And he even went up to one of the major museums. I don't think he wants me to say it on air which one it was. I know which one it was. And with two other colleagues, and they were tested by one of the, I don't know, one of the curators or managers there. And they were tasked with finding oil in Dorset, gold in Cornwall, yeah. and a World War II, I think it was a silo with a possible uh, piece of ordnance still there. I can't remember. Anyway, they were absolutely 100% spot on for everything. And the interesting thing is, is that when they were asked about the East London, I think it was South East London area, which had the silo and ordnance still from World War II, the map that they had been given to work with and to send remote view DAOs from, they ran out of space on the map. And so Peter just kept moving in, in air to a point which if there'd been a map, that's where it would be. And, and this person brought the, another part of the map in, and indeed, there it was, around about that much further along the map. So <clears throat> these, these establishments will not verify that they even had that test there. Mm. They won't, uh, you know, go on record and say, yeah, these three guys came, they did a blinding test, absolutely amazing, no. They won't do. It. We're still working with this absolute friggin' nonsense of, um, you know, the government and certain institutions covering things up like this. Mm -hmm. But the thing about remote viewing, as Peter says, it doesn't matter what they do to something or an area; they can build on it, they can dig it up, but they cannot stop the information that is inherently within the land from being read. Yeah, that's true. Very true. And um, and then. I mean, just last weekend, I was with Peter and we were doing a shoot of um, there's an area in Calverley Grounds. Now, I'll, I'll talk a bit about how there's going to be the, the, the series of the Dowsing Detectives. And this is in preparation for all that, doing some groundwork production. Yeah. And uh, Peter uh, was very interested in so a bit of everything, but anything that is a mystery that he thinks he can help with. He's a very altruistic kind of soul. Um, he has a, a go at trying to solve. And what he, what we were working on, uh, one thing was the Amber Room. I don't know whether people have heard anything about the Amber Room. The Amber Room was um, an amazing, beautiful room that was created in, in Prussia, East Germany, back in the, back in, yeah, the 1700s. And then the, um, one of the kings who took succession there wasn't bothered about that. And when he was trying to make friends with Russia uh, and the guy in Russia, I think it was Peter the Great, loved the room. And so he just said, well, have it. So it was carted over to Russia. And um, there it stayed for 200 years until the Nazis came and pillaged it in about 1941. Mm -hmm. And um, when they set it up in um, a place called Konigs Konigsberg, which is now Kaliningrad, uh, succeeded by the Russians, um, after the war, um, it, 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 there's a castle there and what have you. And the, the, the Nazis could see that the Allies were advancing. They ripped it all down, boxed it, crated it up. And from then on, it's never been known where it is. So then, so Peter gets on the case. So, I mean, there's been, there's been documentaries about this and all the rest of it. And there's not a whisper about where the original Amber Room is. Now, the Russians rebuilt the Amber Room with support from, from the Germans back in, uh, I think they started in 79, it was finished in 2003, which was the 300th anniversary of the Russian, uh, of the Amber Room, which was known in its heyday as the eighth wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, whether you were interested in that or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is that there is a probably, I don't know how many tons of amber it was, I forget now uh, the, that detail, but some tons of amber is about 500 million pounds worth or it could be dollars anyway 
let's say 500 million pounds. It's, it's a lot, whether it's 450 million pounds or whatever. Mm. It's, it's a lot. That's what its value would be today of the original room. And so Peter has been trying to interest the German embassy, the good people of Konigsberg, and all the rest of it. And then what Peter found out as he was moving and working through, he said, hang on here. The Konigsberg that is Kalingrad now is up. If you were saying that because it, it used to be Germany, up right way in the in the northernmost part on the east side. But there is another Konigsberg in the Bayern area, which is near Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. on that border. And that also has a castle. And so there's some very similar things. So and then so he said, now, look, if I was going to the, we just did a little documentary, 13 minutes about this, because he wants to because he's been asked by an art crime magazine for an article, which I edited and he's he's now put together. And then a little film, which is what we've done to go with it, where we explain about this. Let's say it's just a short one. But excuse me a second. But what Peter found was that in this Konigsberg, mm -hmm. in the center, lower center part of Germany, Bavaria, Bayern, there, there is amber found in a wooded area. Well, he said, now, if I was to tell you that in the Baltic Sea area, low, you know, all of that area, it's well known for producing loads and loads of amber, yeah. which is not a stone, it's resin from the pine tree. Mm -hmm. millions 20 million years old something like that. amazing stuff and and also a lot of people wear amber to get little pieces of amber jewelry in little pieces it's not expensive so you know it's affordable so yeah. the point he was making is so if i went over the town i would be likely to find lots of responses to amber so he said the thing is i myself and two colleagues who are remote viewers living in completely different parts of england have also found what I found responses to amber within a bunker structure in Lower Germany, in the wooded area. You don't find amber in wooded area, even though it comes from pine trees. You don't. So this is really exciting. So poor old Peter was really frustrated because he said he'd done all this work. We did the video and now so he's sending it out to um, this um, art crime magazine as mm -hmm. well. And mm -hmm. The thing is, he said, all we need is someone on the land there in that Konigsberg to either go with a bit of divining or he's actually got the bunker. He's been able to uh, bring that out. We've got the dimensions of it. We see this on the on the little video as well. Yeah. So this part of the dowsing detectives, he's a real detective. It is absolutely amazing what he can do. So he gets his. And so what he does, he creates codes. So these are numerical codes, which he calls radionics codes. Radionics is to do with frequency, mm. frequencies. And Delawar, Earl of Delawar used them in, um, in regards of healing. Uh, but it, uh, colors also have a numerical value. And if he paints up a strip, which would be, um, um, I don't know if I've got it to hand. Um, I don't have it to hand. Yes, I do. Um, so let me just show you what that might look like. So these are, oops, these are codes that Peter has okay. painted up. Yep. And each of those, um, each of those are relevant and specific to a very, um, you know, precise thing. And so same with Amber, he, he did that. So he is able to, with, so with the codes and the numbers, if he's got a numerically, uh, orientated code only and, and he hasn't painted that up because the numbers work with the mind better he has to uh, repeat and recite those as he's going toward the thing he's looking for if he's got that painted up with the colors the colors just interact with the body really quickly and he doesn't need to recite the colors or the numbers there and yeah. and it's very very fast so I'm now going to be showing Peter working. We've just, he just finished a big experiment out in uh, Arizona mm -hmm. uh, with someone from the University of Arizona, where he um, communicated with a craft, asked them to be over a site in Arizona um, mm -hmm. at a certain hours. This was on the 23rd and 24th of October, just gone. 
And uh, he was able from a map to tell what was going on by remote viewing it. And then we got our guy in Arizona actually working the field and describing what was happening. And it was exactly as it was an experiment exactly as Peter had delineated. And so this it, is October this year? That, this year? Yes. Literally yes, just got my goodness. Ago, yeah. Okay. Two, wow. three days ago. Yeah. Wow. So it's very ex exciting stuff. And Peter mm. is um, one of those wonderful, uh, eccentric in English individuals and uh, with a very, yeah. very bright mind yeah. who, um, yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, he's been looking at things, you know, the Cleopatra, the real Cleopatra burial yep. place. And yep. there's so many areas we're going to be looking at. So I've just started now filming after many years of talking about it, <laughs> filming a documentary <laughs> of um, the dowsing detectives with Peter as a protagonist. There's no stopping you, Joanne. There's no stopping you. So tell us, tell us the story again for the viewers, because they would love this. Tell us the story of the of the situation in the garden with the markers. Um, oh, I didn't tell you that, did I? Yeah. yeah. Tell us that story. Uh, now, just, just outlay basically what this is about so people know where you're coming from. All right. So I mentioned Jeff Crockford, who was the lead of the biolocation team, which since his demise has kind of disbanded. I think one or two guys get together and do some work. But otherwise, you know, there's no formal group meetings. There's no field trips and all the rest of that, which is a, a real shame. Anyway, so um, Jeff had so back in the early days, Jeff had invited me, I, I think through through Peter's introduction, invited me to come over to his home um, in Hertfordshire uh, to uh, talk about what he did and to to see where the ET element was and you know, because that was my bag and, and to sh really introduce me to this whole world of hologrammatic interrogation of different different uh, things. And uh, uh, that's not a very good way to express it. But let me just tell you what I saw and then I can express it. So okay. when I arrived, she's got a small lawn up in the front and it was kind of pegged out. So like you might have tent pegs, but with a little flag on. And I went, oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I couldn't see... You know, there was nothing being, nothing on the ground to indicate why that was pegged out. He said, oh, he said, that's the size of a small craft that's a mile or two up, above us. And this is the hologram of it. And we can interrogate it and tell you who's on board, tell you what the creatures are like, whether they're carbon based, silicon based, copper based blood. What weapons they're using, what propulsion system they're using. I went, what? And then after the cup of tea and shock wore off i was at the front garden which is considerably larger and there was a real time a real relevant uh, relative positioning of our solar system hmm. a hologram of it that had been uh, that, that, <laughs> that that was magnetically magnetically detectable so it is, you know, this is this is quite new for me to speak about in the world. So I'm finding my own way through language to describe, yeah, which yeah. I'm going to have to learn to do a, a lot better. <laughs> Sorry about that. No um, but okay. it was it was amazing. So Jeff's with his dowsing rods now, and he said, "So this is the sun here." So he showed me round the universe, our solar system, mm -hmm. and and I, I mean, it was amazing to go round the planetary bodies now. When I say the planetary bodies, I don't mean he'd put a big globe there or anything. He pegged out like with these with, with flags on and each and sometimes the flags were coloured. So the flags may mean, say, this one's Earth and that one's Mars and that one's the sun. And uh, and the relative distance was real time. This was real time. What was going on that moment in the garden? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you how he was able to do that. That will be a disclosure for another time within the documentary. But it is. It is freaking amazing <laughs> yeah. it is freaking amazing and then he i started f following him through as he was moving and and as the rods were opening and closing and i said well what, what are you he said i'm i'm checking where the he said i'm following some craft who are going out of the solar system and i'm following the now he had only got so much garden <laughs> <laughs> so he'd run out of you know he'd come to the end of the solar system and they were out the other end right. and now if he'd have made that hologram much smaller he could have then accommodated mm. the other, you know, the other part of what was over the other side. And 
and there were two big craft and he was describing the craft describing the kind of people on on board and it 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 was i mean i i, I was uh, you know slack jawed i thought is this real could this be real yeah. Yeah. could this because if this is true then communication with et with with these other magnetically orientated groups and there it's all magnetic you know it's mm -hmm. all in our sensory system it's easy we can do it it's just i'm not that good at it i, I can well, i can do it to some degree i had, just haven't had time to apply myself to be honest i've been you know <laughs> and i have i have hours upon hours upon hours of footage of field trips i've done with the guys and and anyway all, all the rest of it which i shall be you know well, using it just on. totally breaks down the whole idea of uh oh should we just say disclosure i oh, for goodness sake i mean the whole <laughs> idea of contact setty are out of a job straight away i mean come on guys you're oh well exactly i done know well, have you? What yeah are you playing at? you know i i met he's in his garden and he's got it all mapped out yeah and all the others and the other members of the team have you know i've been been to been to others you, you know and and set <laughs> they've set up other things i mean but it's it's very very interesting i mean if people want to know about their work which was phenomenal groundbreaking secret of the stones by jeff crockford and nigel hughes and phoenix yeah. point yeah that's the one i've um, read I've, I've, the second one i haven't read the first one yet the the yeah one. well that, that takes some doing i tell you but yeah. it, it, i have done it and it, and it is it is an, an amazing an amazing thing it's um it, it puts communication and, you know, knowledge uh, into a whole different category because the physicist was talking about, you know, maybe reverse engineering, but not reverse engineering, engineering from what they were finding. Uh, you know, they, they got everything down to a fine T of, of what the component parts, just like what the bloods were of the beings on board and the types that they were were they aquatic were they mm -hmm. you know others mm -hmm. uh, absolutely extraordinary and then those guys peter didn't get involved so much in that bit but they they then had this massive challenge of communication with their guides and all these guys who were the biolocation team they all had their guides who would communicate with them independently and 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 as a team about you know what was going on and one of them would talk about how he'd have a, a sort of sensing that they were you know perhaps there at like two o'clock in, in the in the morning whatever and and it's like they were wanting to to communicate and he was able to track them magnetically he knew i mean every it's it was, it was amazing it is mind-blowing absolutely it's, so when are these um, documentaries when are they going you're getting them done now yeah i'm plan just i'm just really getting to launch them or um, no, no, I, no idea really. Again, it's getting um, some interest to to move them forward because these need to be out there and and done well. I'm I'm doing the best I can do, um, yeah. which which will be a, a form of a presentation. But um, I'm hoping that there'll be some interest to move it into the realms of you know Netflix or whoever because yeah. this is another level. This is a yeah. whole another way, and it's accessible to the people so it's well, not like you know yeah. nobody else can do it we say come on everybody come and do it come and join us to do that and you know down the line i'll probably see if we can get a group together just to come and do a test that peter will have set up and to see how people do because I'll, most people i'll tell you what I'll, i'd love to be involved with this i'll really yeah. like, from from a whole studio perspective yeah i reckon we could um get our fingers dirty with this one um, yeah it, it's very exciting it's because it's um it, it has limitless potential and you know whilst we've got peter um who is you know long retired and this is his passion um i i mean i know we're, we're probably at the end now but you know there's another a, a, another show worth <laughs> material <laughs> easy to to Absolutely. come from say the fred west stuff i won't go into that now and well, um, guys that's, well this is it i was hoping to have gone there but we'll have to have you back again and this is going to happen i'm sure we're going to drag you back in kicking and screaming even if you <laughs> want to or not we will drag you back in on one of these wednesday shows with the added extra <laughs> yeah, and great. uh that sounds like a plan but uh do you know what the last two hours i've been absolutely totally enthralled and uh it's been oh, a good. pleasure to have you on the show 
Oh, that's great. Really, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You. Joanna Summerscales, thank you for coming on and being a part of The Invited. I really well, do appreciate Well, thank that. you for the invitation and I hope your listeners enjoyed it. I think they have. Looking by the chat going on in that there chat room, <laughs> that's been amazing. All right. Okay, Bye. guys, um, we'll say goodnight. Well, goodbye to you for now. Yeah, um, I'm going to go and, back uh, to editing now. <laughs> go back and do some more work. Oh, yeah, I have another two or three hours. <laughs> oh, well, there you are. All right. Well, uh, okay. I'll be in touch with you sometime very soon. All right. Now. Absolutely great. Thanks, John, for all that you're doing and creating a platform for everybody to share material Lord. like this and more. Very important that uh, also we come together. So people out there, thank you very much for listening. And um, if you guys want to become involved with any of this dowsing detective stuff, you can let me know. <laughs> Lovely. Brilliant stuff. On that note, we're going to say goodnight. Okay. Good night. Cheers, everyone, for watching. I'll see you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.